Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Disgustingly Resilient podcast and today I'm joined by two very special guests who are actually defying the odds and doing quite well with Death Guard you could say which is ironic given the stream I just did about talking about hitting a wall so uh, these guys are apparently breaking through the wall and crashing onto the other side with victory in their sight so today I'm joined by Grant and Daniel uh, I forgot your second name so please introduce yourself with your second name because I'm useless at this Hey, uh, I'm Grant Kaufman uh, I've been playing Death Guard competitively for a couple of years now. Um, yeah, yeah, I play for uh, Xenos Petting Zoo, and uh, this is Daniel. Daniel. Hey, Daniel Reda Hayes, uh, also um, a teammate of Grant's. We're also pretty good friends. I was telling uh, Aiden that we live like 20 minutes away each other, from each other, so we very frequently, um, you know, work together on lists. And you know, as Aiden's going to kind of talk about, our lists are actually very similar. Um, most of the time, they actually do consolidate into one list, so kind of more or less running the same thing even though we like to kind of argue you know about what's good what's not or you know take things out of spite uh because someone says it's bad try to prove them wrong yes yeah, we like to argue a lot that's kind of our <laughs> kind of our thing that's, that's the way it's supposed <laughs> yeah. to be isn't it you're not you're not friends if you're not arguing between each other <laughs> yeah it, it's like a, a game of magic will turn into us talking about 40k and like it's like hey you you you're it's been your turn for 20 minutes like are you gonna do anything? <laughs> yeah. you gonna you gonna you gonna react to that <laughs> <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> well yeah so I wanted to dispel your counter <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's, it's good to have you on because obviously like i said but just then uh you guys have actually booked the trend uh one is when uh obviously the whole was it six and oh wasn't it it was a six, six round event was it I believe yeah so, yeah. so it was six rounds yeah six round event six round event. and daniel what was yours you went to was it five and one or was it four and one it was a. Uh, it was six and one. It was Salt Lake. It was a seven round event. Yeah. You Americans, yeah, it was, uh, weird event only... numbers. <laughs> we only have five rounds in. That's it. <laughs> it's five rounds and then the cuffs yeah. and that's it. Um, right. Yeah. It's like five rounds, four rounds, seven rounds, twelve rounds. Like it, you're never really sure until you read the pack and you're like, oh wait, <laughs> this is gonna be a long weekend. <laughs> it's a long day. <laughs> so I've got yeah. a list on the screen here for the people who are watching. Um, so I'm just gonna go quickly go through the list, talk about it. So this is Grant's list. This one. Um, so we've got a Biological Putrefier, Foul Blight Spawn. Two malignant playcasters, then to got Typhus, one full ten man plague marines with the um, actually more melee than usual than I than I'd personally run, uh, but he still made sure he got the two flamers in there. Then we got one squad of ten death guard cultists, a big death shard brick terminator, so a full six man. We got three fetid bloat drones with the flesh mowers, two chaos rhinos, the big man Rotogus himself. A unit of Nurglings because battle line requirements, which I forgot about when I was building a list recently. I put Rogus in a list. I was like, what do you think of this? Right? He's like, where's your battle line? I was like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then three War Dog Brigands bring it back. So obviously we've got the Biology Street Fire, the Foul Blight Spawn, joining the 10-man Plague Marines. And the two Plague uh, Casters rolling around in the bus on their own is what I'm going to assume. Can you confirm that for me? And then talk oh, with yeah, your list and your that. ideas. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I think uh, watching your previous podcast, you kind of covered the 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 core of the list. But the idea is, it's like a threat overload list, right? So um, it's pretty easy if I send out like a unit of death shroud or a unit of plague marines uh, by themselves, right? To you know take an objective or trade for tra trade a you know trade um, to for your opponent to kill that, right? Um, but what I found is with three brigands, Rodigus, death shroud. Plague Marines, all that coming out at the same time, right? And then using the drones to trade for objectives, that it's very often very hard for an opponent to 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 wit like brunt the full force of Death Guard, right? I, I believe that Death Guard's biggest strength is not how tanky they are. Um, it's how good they are at close range combat, shooting and melee. So the list tries to lean into that, right? Like how much good close range melee stuff can I bring? That makes sense. So I'm guessing then with the idea of this list is sort of your first turn, you're kind of like just trying to get in position stage a bit more. Um, I do have a question about Rotogus, um, but we'll get into him in a second and how you play him. But is it kind of like when you have your go turn, it is like full commit, everything is going out? Yeah. So usually, depending on the terrain, right, uh, there's two units that want to start in reserves, right? It's Rodigus, um and the Death Shroud, of course, right? Um, if I have a place that I can, and it's really hard to talk about one without talking about the other. So if I have a place that I can stage with the death shroud, right? So safely behind an objective, right? Think like an inch or two away from a point, but behind a wall, right? A breachable wall. Um, Rodigus a hundred percent starts in reserves and turn two, or sometimes turn three, I'm going to be looking to rapid ingress Rodigus, right? Find a hole, force him to screen him, right? 
uh, and then connects because Radagus is uh, for a Nurgle demon incredibly killy, right? Seven attacks at strength eight after the minus one toughness, right? And potentially minus one to save, uh, AP three, damage four. That's a great profile, right? Yeah. Especially for killing Tormators and honestly light vehicles. So he's very killy, um, and his aura of like half OC and half move when he connects after the rapid ingress forces your opponent to play by Death Guard's rules, which is we're both going to be slow, we're both going to get stuck in, right? And we're going to fight. And that's what Death Guard excels at. That's a good point, yeah. So obviously, uh, people sometimes overlook that rule. And you also have access to the damage to sweep, uh, which is it's like 14 attacks, is it, on that as well? Which is attacks. yeah, which is kind of crazy when you actually think about it. Because like, we got Marty with his 15 damage one sweeps, and you got a, you got a 230 point greater demon over here. Rocking around with damage two sweeps, which is really really nice. Um, one yeah. quick one quick question about the plus one damage because I actually needed to ask this to myself. Um, because it's a damage modifier and it's a bonus, if someone has something to like blank out damage, would it still deal one damage to them? Because wouldn't it blank it out to zero and then plus the one on from the ability at the end of it? Yeah, yeah it as, as far as I know, a, a zero damage is a multiplicative modifier, so you would you would divide or multiply by zero. And then it would become zero, and then you would add. It's the same thing with like melter rules. Yeah. So like if you're within twelve of the brigand, right, you're still doing four, even though you you uh, zeroed out. So it's the same thing. It's like uh, very similar also to Satans, where if you half damage, so Rodigus one damage goes to one damage, and then it goes to two damage. So yeah, it, it gets around a lot of that. That's actually that quite a cute. By the way, he was originally an attack against a Satan, um, <laughs> because you know that fourteen attack sweep at strength seven at AP one is pretty good at getting through their uh, their their like four up involve, uh like half damage roll. You yeah, because you're in the game. Yeah, it's gonna deal two damage to it flat. That's actually really cool. That so I didn't think about that one there. Um, so you saying basically that the Death Shroud and the sort of Rogus kind of all come down together and sort of want to put a lot of pressure on your opponent. Um, so one question for me is then, officer, you've gone for the heavy flesh mowers on your drones, no no splitters. What was the reasoning for that? Because obviously some people will be like, oh, but the spitters give you all the Overwatch potential. Um, so how come you up with a triple flesh mower over like spitters? So uh, there's a couple of war gear decisions that I make that are not super common, right? We can talk about this and we can talk about the Plague Marines, right, simultaneously. Uh, the flesh mowers, um, the reasoning behind taking um, uh, flesh mowers over spitters first is that um, melee weapons uh, I found in Death Guard, especially when you take minus one weapon skill, ballistic skill, will often get two activations, right? So I'll usually activate on my turn and then I'll activate on my opponent's turn. So that's 20 attacks, right, is the way I look at it. Um, I usually rate units, like, internally by the amount of activations I think I can get with them, right? And you, you, could, you could argue, okay, Grant, but, like, you're probably going to get to activate with an Overwatch, right? Um, there are other units in that list that want to Overwatch, right? Death Shroud gets seven D6 Flamer shots. Yep. Rodigus has a great, has an even better Flamer with Dead Wounds, right? The Plague Marines have an amazing Overwatch, right? Including two Plague Spitters. So I found that the drones often don't want to overwatch unless we're specifically playing against elves, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, even even when we even we like uh, just consider just the attack, so not no overwatch or nothing, right? Like it's seven hits right from the the plague spitters, uh, plague spitters versus seven hits with a couple lethals from the drone, right? So if we consider that everything wants to get in melee, to me it makes sense. Plus the tank shot changes to have your yeah. Um, your drone equipped with melee weapons. And the last point I'd like to make is that um, there's the secrets angle, right? Or not secrets, uh, secondary uh, actions angle. Um, drones uh, want to be doing actions. That's what they're in the list for, right? If I have spitters on a drone, it's unlikely that my opponent is going to be afraid to tag that unit. Now, remember, you can't fall back and do actions anymore. If I have a melee weapon on that drone, they're not just going to randomly charge it. They don't want to eat 10 melee attacks. So That's if I true. have to sabotage, right, or uh, the deployment zone one, right, uh, then that drone will be able to do it. Whereas if it had spitters, it might have just been charged by five cavalites, you know? Yeah, that is true. Um, I didn't think about it that way, actually. It's quite clever because I suppose it also... It helps you in terms of not being tempted to shoot with it as well. You know, and like you said, it's this is your dedicated this thing. You want to be doing actions. Taking away the guns as well is like, okay... Its purpose now is 100% to action because I'm not going to be char if I'm not charging, I'm just going to look to do actions with it and score points. Yeah. Where is if you have spitters, sometimes you do something stupid, you're like, oh, I can get an angle there, and you give up an action to spray away like five guardsmen, like, well, you know, 
well well done. Um, <laughs> also stops you getting screwed over on the shots because obviously spitters have like um, they do have variance. Like okay, it averages out a lot of the time and you get good, but we've all had it where you've gone to spend an overwatch and you hit the double one, and it's it's the worst feeling in the world because you felt like you wasted it. Um, whereas I'm like I, I ever watched Plague Wars Cross, at least then they have like a little machine gun and the mortar as well, so it's not doesn't feel too bad. And like Plague Marines again, they have like the foul blight spawn flame and the hyper blight grenades, the plasma gun that you've brought along. Whereas like with just the drone, it can be like literally that's all you get. If you draw that double one, cool, you're not doing anything else for the rest of the <laughs> for the rest of the turn. Yeah. So yeah. That. like honestly the way I see it is uh the drone wants to shoot like five mana of elves, like you know, like very small elf units. Yeah. Um I don't kill a five man a five man elf unit on average with the drone uh, on Overwatch, right? So if that's if that's the case, right? Like, what's the difference between a five man elf squad, right, and a like a one man elf squad? They're both doing an action or move blocking, right? Like, yeah. or denying area for deep strike. There is no difference, right? So if you know, if I want to bring weight of plague spitters, right, I want to bring as many plague marines with plague spitters and um, drones with plague spitters as I can, then that makes sense. I think plague spears are a great profile, um, but the purpose of that unit is not to to kill infantry. I have so many other good options for that. It's to push out my um, deep strike denial, right? To spread my contagions and to do actions and also to advance, right? Like we want those things moving down the board. Hey, shoot this! It's coming right at your shooting units. Don't shoot the brigands. Don't shoot the rhino. Yeah, that's a good point. And another thing I'd say as well is, as I don't know if you guys have noticed it, the more I've been playing with the plague spitter drones as well, especially into marine matchups. Marines actually realize that because they're just damage one, they're not actually as scary as they think. So like you say anti infantry two up to them, and a lot of like the like the the less experienced players they'll be like, Oh, I don't want to get shot by that. That's gonna wound me dead easy. But the, the other experienced ones are like, okay, so on average I'll lose like a marine and a half, maybe two. Um whereas if it's a like you said, a ten attack flesh mode with the damage two, like you can't risk charging that with like five assault intercessors, um five jump assault intercessors, because genuinely if that thing lives, then it's it's got a real good chance of at least killing like four like guys back on the on the attack which is obviously then a big much more bigger impact than the two shots on the sprayers were killed like two guys tops yeah and no please oh okay uh <laughs> yeah i think the drone exactly what grant's saying too and one of the things that i also kind of like to incorporate as well is because this is a dice game obviously the game is very wild right like i played one of my friends brandon a while back and i failed a four inch charge and it lost me the game right you don't have cp but with the drone because it has lethal hits you could roll out theoretically and roll like four, four five sixes right to hit like that happened in one of my games with salt like into the demon matchup where he charged a great unclean one uh the great unclean one charged him didn't do any damage i did eight damage back and it's like it's obviously very wild there but there's a there's a multiplier there where you can actually really pop off and it's pretty reasonable at strength seven two damage or like you said charging marines now i'm ap2 because you're minus one save because that's what you take into marines because it's it's really good and it's kind of hilarious that they just kind of like crumple over and die <laughs> kind of funny. anything that's AP2. <laughs> yeah it, it's really funny and um i think that 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 is a huge multiplier and at least like grant was saying they're good for actions um in some games you i have them roll up together so they're in like a little pack of three. It's like, well, are you really going to be able to contest this all? Right? Like, you don't want three drones charging you. Now that's 30 attacks, right? Now you're you're actually starting to chew through things that are normally that Plague Spitters won't do. And, you know, I, I do really fall around the, uh, the camp that if you have a Plague Spitter drone, you can just whiff. Like, I roll actually pretty poorly on my Flamer shots for my Plague Rates. <laughs> and I can't imagine spending a CP to, like, have my drone only do that. Yeah, I think that's I, a big deal. I think as well, like you said, if if you put, if I put three plague spitter drones going down a flank, and you've got like I don't know, let's say, um, let's say you've just got like a, a tank, like I like say, I know it's a mirror match, like whatever. PBC, you got PBC, um, three plague spitter drones, you genuinely probably not going to give a shit. Um, three flesh more drones, that will probably kill a PBC. So like, you can't just ignore it, and I don't think anyone's going to ignore three flesh more drones running them down and when you kind of think about it that's 270 points which is kind of insane for something that you genuinely like can't ignore um so yeah actually you know what that makes a lot of sense so i can see the flesh more drones being used as that like pressure piece sort of pushing forward w one thing i did want to ask and you can um we could talk about the difference as well because i know dan will talk about your changes just in a second but um grant you opt for the triple brigand in your list um now as someone who has just bought his first box of war dogs because i've tried to stay death guard pure but i'm finally admitting to the fact that maybe i'm just screwing myself over by doing that um 
please tell me how to play brigands and how they you play them and how they work in your list because I know my first game I'm going to put them out there and it's going to die instantly because I'm an idiot. Um, so how should I be playing my brigands and how should the people listening be using these like double or triple brigands that they're bringing along? So uh, I'm a big brigand proponent. I'm a big brigand guy. Right? I love my war dogs. Right? They're great. Uh, I've been running them since uh, like Cali Cup of uh, Cali Cup and um, uh, what's it called? SoCal Open of last year. So it's been a year of just brigands in my list. Um, so I, I, uh, I have a lot to say about this. Uh, and we only have, you know, an hour. Uh, but, so I'll try and boil it down to a couple minutes. Uh, you t- take the floor because really- I'm learning on this one. So I'm, I'm more than happy to say like, mm, yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, brigands are really important. Uh, uh, moving them is really important, right? So um, where you stage them, right? Um, they only have a 24 inch range melta, right? And the real threat range of that melta is um, 12 inches, right? And they move 12, right? So the threat range of a brigand is effectively 24. Right for that big damage belt a shot. Um, your opponent, uh, if they're if they're good, if they understand what Death Guard does, is going to respect exactly twenty four inches away from that brigand. Right. So a lot of the game is positioning your brigands such that uh, when they come out, right, um, they are like, for example, twenty four inches exactly away from any part of an objective. Right. Like you can't fly your tank onto this objective or get within shooting range of this unit. Uh, without being within brigand melter range. They are a counter punch unit, right? Um, a lot of it is also making sure that you're not risking brigands without risking the rest of your army, right? Like I never risk a brigand by itself, right? I pre-measure every shooting activation that my opponent has, right? I'm like, when I, I deploy them last, I leave spots for them. I make sure that my opponent does not get to shoot my brigands for nothing. Oftentimes in games, you'll see that if my brigands are exposed, Literally every other single unit in my army is exposed, right? Because if I, if these brigands are going to draw shooting activations, then my play brains or my death shroud or my Rodigus is going to connect, right? So if we if we need to trade, right? Let's trade, right? I'll <laughs> I'll get less points with my brigands than I than I would have if uh, what's it called? Uh, if I waited maybe for you to get closer, but I will make sure that I will connect to something else. If that makes sense? Yeah, it so, makes sense. It's all positioning. It's all making sure that if you want to come out and shoot my Rhino, all three brigands are, are going to come out and shoot back at you. Um, and making sure that like, okay, like I, this is where I think my opponent is going to go. This is, I'm going to stage my brigands so that I can make sure that I'm going to be able to respond with really the only good, in my opinion, uh, anti-tank shooting that Death Guard has available to Yeah, I'm, I'm coming to the conclusion on that. I've, I mean, I've tried the entropies, I've tried Predator Destructors, um, Everyone raves about them, but man, I have tried them so many times, and those things like just bounce off everything I shoot at. <laughs> so I found yeah. that with with more terror, like you, people have to like when they take the predators with the the last cans, they I feel like they also shoehorn themselves into taking Mortarian, who's you know he's gotten a lot cheaper, but he's still really expensive for a guy that doesn't really do much. And yeah, at the end of the day, I still personally believe that brigands with the Melter rule. Are still just better than predators. Like even if they ignore mods, like okay, you're half damage. Yeah, AP four, AP six. If like AP four uh, is the minimum <laughs> you'll get. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. Is, I AP imagine just doesn't isn't isn't what it is. I imagine it's quite funny when you tell your. I mean, I imagine you said to the opponent before, yeah, it's AP six, and they've had a quite a funny look on the face when they look back. Here. I uh, I have uh, so one sometimes I'll put a, a brigand in reserves. Right, especially if I'm playing against space brains that are spamming armor, like Iron, St- uh, like former Iron Storm, um, and uh, the look on people's faces when I like come out of reserves. This has happened like at least three times uh, at tournaments where I'll come out of reserves, right? Uh, not even rapid ingressing, just normal reserves, right? And put two melta shots into their tank, right? And roll two hits because they hit on twos, and then roll uh, one wound, and then re-roll the other wound into a wound, right? And then they're like, "All right, armor contempt. I'm a, I'm gonna take a save." I'm like, "Oh no, it's AP six. Like, you don't need a save." <laughs> also, min damage. Yeah, it's min damage ten. <laughs> like, yeah, that's pretty yeah, nice. It's, yeah. it's it's a hell of a drug <laughs> to say the very least. So, so on that topic yeah. you said there, how um how, when you deploy your brigands, are you deploying them as like packs together, or are you deploying them separately, spread out, or is it really like dependent on the matchup? Because like you said then space marines are like a lot of vehicles. You'll usually put one in strategic reserve. So is that something you find yourself commonly doing as well as using reserves? And how do you sort of deploy them? Is it together or is it more spread out evenly? It depends entirely, uh, honestly, less on the um, the matchup and on the mostly on the train. Right, like if I have a if I have spots that I can hide brigands without getting shot, 
um, I'll put all three brigands on the board because the brigands being on the board forces your opponent to play a lot safer. Um, otherwise, if I uh, if I think that like uh, for example, if the Death Shroud have a spot to stage, right? They don't need to be in reserves. Um, a brigand might start in reserves, right? I might rapid ingress it to make sure that I can get that Melta shots through. Uh, yeah, it really it really just depends, right? Like um, it depends a lot on the train and the shooting that they have available. Right. That's, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, what are the um, the plague bus in your list? So the the malignant plague caster bus is that on the board as well in yours? Is that doing any cheeky outflanking maneuvers or how do you play that? Because obviously you don't have the marines in it, which is I've said before like it's it's an optional choice to have marines in there or not. You've gone for using it as a full on like death bus almost. Um, so how do you play around with that and how does it fit into your list? Because um, obviously you can't just like put it somewhere, shoot five marines out of turn for the primary. Like, this is solely dedicated to the playcasters inside. So putting the uh, bus in reserves isn't something I've explored enough. Uh, I think it's a really good idea and a, and a really way to like level up your death guard like ability uh, and the tools in your toolkit. Um, my list has a lot of things that want to be in reserves. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that, that's why I haven't experimented with that much. Um, honestly, the playcaster bus kind of does what it says in the tin, right? It comes out, right? I think the the AP goes up to like five. <laughs> right um again you're crazy right with the plus the plus two ap strategy potentially and then minus one to save ap5 potentially ignore cover with the other strat right so you're really pushing saves with that thing uh it blows up light vehicles it blows up uh anything that really isn't t12 right it blows up um you know infantry uh it uh it, it also has a threat range of 24 inches it's just another thing that can um uh what's it called can come out and and just just really really kill stuff and i think i think uh going back and having watched some of your content you do cover it quite a bit um as like a tech piece so uh, i think the, the really interesting thing that i want to add about uh, the plague bus or the budget redeemer as we call it over here um <laughs> is uh when you're using it right a lot of people see it as oh my gosh it's a rhino that gives up two characters right like and then the rhino dies and then the malignant plague casters die Right, and then how much value did I really get out of this? Right, if I want to run a unit like this, why not just space prints? Um, the value of the Malignant Plague Caster bus, um, besides the like getting out and doing actions with one of the characters, is that when I stage that rhino to shoot something, I always tuck that rhino butt um, next to a piece of train. And the reason I do that is because when that rhino explodes from the shoot back, I have those plague casters get out behind the train piece so that they can't be shot. Yeah. And then they get in the next Rhino, and they do it again. <laughs> oh, because you've obviously got your 10 out in the second one. Yes, yeah, it's like picking up the next Uber, right? <laughs> I like, oh, that's quite so, good. The Plague Bus never dies, right? It just moves. <laughs> <That's right? going. laughs> there, there's something dies. about them destroying the Rhino, and then you you or in like you tag them, and then they just fall back into the Rhino, and they go, oh, you can't shoot. Like, no, this is firing deck. Where have you been? I'm now going to shoot you yeah. again. Uh, it's It's wild. I, I like that. That's, that's really clever, actually. Um, so, um, just uh, so we'll go. We'll talk to. Uh, so, not talk to you. We'll go to Dan. So, Dan, you've obviously made some changes to this list uh, in yours. What have you took out, and what have you changed it for? Reasons why, and is it like a personal playstyle thing? Have you found it better? Um, so, yeah, take take away, take it away. So, w one of the things that we kind of mentioned earlier uh, before we started is uh, Grant and I like to argue about you know rules. Um, you know, he, he has pitched to me, Daniel, what do you think about 30 Blightlord Terminators with minus one damage sorcerers? And I'm like, Grant, you're insane. And then he sends me a list. I'm like, I don't hate this. You know, it's like we, we so we, we go a lot of back and forth. And um, our pairings are also kind of wildly different in tournaments. Um, there have been so many times where I will roll up against like guard. And I just, for the life of me, the guard player just rolls extremely well every single time. Um, I played someone at SoCal Open that brought two of the uh, Primaris Psyker, Tempest of Scions, and like Torox Primes. So they're rerolling everything. Everything has sustained. Everything has dev wounds. And it's just, like not everything, but like the Primaris Psyker, yeah. right? And I was having a lot of trouble getting to these like Rogal Dorns that I just couldn't touch because they were screening me from my brigands. So I said, Grant, what about a carnivore? And he said, Daniel, but with three brigands. It's not two brigands, it's three brigands. I'm like, you know what, Grant? I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to take a carnivore. So I took a carnivore, and that's really the only fundamental difference. I took a shamble rot on the ten man, and it came up once uh, in my seventh round against demons because he rolled like a five on his charge when he was like three inches away. So he <laughs> failed. 
or four inches away or whatever it is, right? That's it's like such a feel, failed. but <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 really great. Um, but I tried out the carnivore. I love the carnivore. I think it's really great. But um, I think moving forward, I'll probably go back to three brigands, especially with kind of the archetype tweaks that I've been playing around with for things like team events. Um, but you you can pretty much run either. Um, I would definitely say probably the uh, the triple brigands is objectively better because the shooting is very powerful. I am just a sucker for melee. I think six attacks at strength twelve, AP four with minus one save, minus one toughness, D six plus two damage. Like you can really get in there and kind of bonk some stuff that you yeah. really can't get to. But the problem is, as and Grant will agree with this, is it it, it uh, clogs up your rapid egress targets, right? Because the death trout aren't starting on the table. They need to be rapid ingressed. Same for Rodigus. Unless you want to just ball out, drop down, and say, I'm a hope I'm going to make this nine, but if I don't, I'm not just going to die because my entire army has also come out as well. So, you know, there's a lot of play there. I mean, the Carnivore moves 14, so he's pretty fast. And you end into armies like Sisters as well, like that 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 cheeky emulator that just will not leave you alone. You can rapid ingress behind a, a fixed piece and just go for it, right? So there, there's a lot of value there that I found especially in Utah, um, because the, the training was pretty dense. And uh, my matchups were a lot different than his. You know, I played uh, against Imperial Knights. Uh, he rolled up and did, like, 20 damage to Canis Rex. Died in return, <laughs> but now Canis Rex is on, like, two wounds. Yeah, that's worth it. So, you know, a, yeah, a little grenade. Like, oh, now you're dead. Hector gets out, like, hey, Hector, do you want to move? Or I'm going to overwatch you. You know, things like that. So it was a little more of a stylistic choice uh, difference, but um, we, we pretty much have consolidated on what's the best. I just like to try new things, and um, Grant will tell me that they're bad, and I sometimes I don't like to listen. <laughs> that's fair, that's fair. Are you both fully in agreement on Rotogus, though? Because I've seen Rotogus pop up in, like, four of the best performing Death Guard lists at the moment. Um, I, I, is Rotogus, was Rotogus a fun pick, or do you genuinely think this guy is, like, should be in your list? Uh, I think he's a very solid choice. Um, right now, I'm, I'm going to a GT this weekend, and um, I actually don't have him on my list. Um, but I'm just because I want to try out the second 10 man and see how valuable it is for like team matchups. Yeah. Because after WTC, Blood Angels kind of had a very meh performance. So maybe we don't see Blood Angels very often, and maybe a second 10 man for like Dark Angels is better. We'll see. So that's kind of like my logic there. But I mean, he's. He's so good. And this was kind of where, where we, we had this whole conversation where I said, Grant, what's the point of Rodigus? And he said, what's bad about Rodigus? And we start labeling off all of these rules that we've just discussed. And it's like, this is, it may not necessarily be an auto take, but it, it, it shores up a lot of, of what Death Guard really lack. One of which being an effective T12 unit with a four-up invul. The only other thing you have that, that that's Mortarian. And I feel like, again, if you're taking Mortarian, you're now centering your list around a different archetype, which, in my opinion, may not be the most optimal because the ignoring mods is really cool, but Mortarian's just going to die. And yeah. unfortunately, that's that's just the reality of the world. And it's a 320 point, 325 point unit um, versus Rodigus is 235. So you essentially get a drone yeah. and Rodigus over Mortarian, which seems like a much better choice than just Mortarian. One thing I'll um, say, yeah. I know it's because I obviously did Leeds this weekend, and uh, Marty not obviously having the ability to deep strike, which is probably one of the biggest changes from him and Rodgus. Like, okay, yeah, you've got the two up save, and Rodgus doesn't. Rodgus has more wounds, which I think maths out to being like mathematically near Mortarian because of the feel no pain anyway, because the 16 and the feel no pain, and then he's got 20 easy 22. He's, he's 22, 22 yeah. and Mortarian has effectively 24. Yeah, so it's, it roughly works out the same there. Um, but again, like you said, the, I think the ability for Rodrigus to appear where the fight is, because I had a lot of games where um, either I got angled from some of that can, like, again, hypercrypt, and what, he just died instantly. And even the games that he didn't, he'd usually take about something like seven to eight damage just trying to get into the fight. And once he's in there, he's not too bad. But again, if you have Rodrigus who can, like, rapid ingress appear, get into the fight at full health, it's actually probably more durable than Mortarion at that point because you're making units fall back, um, which then they're obviously not activating. Um, he's obviously got... I actually think he might have genuinely just a better melee output than Mort, even though mort has got the strength higher. Um, go, go on, Grant. You have an opinion on that. Oh, my gosh. Rodrigus' melee is, like, crazy, right? Like, I have straight... I picked up, like, four, like four or five like minus one damage terminators before right like it, it is like be, being able to just say all right here's like seven attacks right like ap4 d6 
damage four, right? Here you go, lethal hits. They're not expect. No one's expecting that. Yeah. Like no one's like, oh my god, or, or 14 sweep attacks. Whatever goes in Aragus, <laughs> he's good. Like, he's probably gonna kill, right? I, like, or put eight damage on at least. I think the wildest thing is when you, when I looked at Rogus, I hadn't looked at him in a while, and when I started looking at him again, you look at the things that Rogus might get charged by and stuff like Innocent Companions, uh, Deathwing Knights. He's cheaper than all of them. Yeah. <laughs> like what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, so wait, so even if they kill him, but then die to shoot in exchange, you traded up with a toughness twelve for a vulnerable monster. I was like, what the yeah. fuck? <laughs> um, I yeah. played um, when I was in Cherokee uh, a few months back. Uh, I made it had made it to the top eight, and my round uh, my round seven opponent was Colin Cochran playing Chaos Knights. It was all dog walker and. You know, round two, he uh, he made a decision to either let you know, screen out his back line or just go towards me and try and rush me down, which I think was probably the best choice, but still not a great choice because you know Death Guard are really good in in, um, in yeah. close melee as we've established. I actually did take minus one weapon skill, ballistic skill over the extra AP. Um, a lot of people in chat were saying that that wasn't a great choice, but I personally find you know if you're hitting on threes with carnivores, there's a lot of a higher chance that you're just gonna whiff. If I tag a brigand, now you're hitting on fours if you're shooting in combat or out of combat. But Rodigus on an objective, he requires two um, carnivores to take it from him. So if he's on an objective with a war dog, this is mine now. Yeah. So you have to now have more on there, which means you're drawing away from the rest of the army. And I think that's, it's pretty massive, especially for things that do have a lot of OC. So now you have to have 10 OC before you actually can test him on an objective. And if I put anything on that objective, like a Rhino, now I have 7 OC. So now you need a lot. It, it, it compounds even more, and it really plays into a lot more of a primary denial style as well. Because once you take the middle, or if you find a cheeky spot in the back to bop them in, and you know you just are a total chat and just make all of your 9-inch charges, like I did in War Games Live, it's like, all right, well, the, the game's kind of over now. Like You have <laughs> yeah. to kind of pop off to win, or else I'm just going to table you. Or, you know, Rodigus is just going to sit on an objective and hold it for the rest of the game. There's nothing you can do about it. That sounds really cool. I'm out. Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to go and buy a Rodigus as well now. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> go on, Grant. What are you about to say? Uh, that half OC aura is really important. Um, and it makes me think. Uh, I, I've heard a lot of talk from Death Guard players about how they only take minus one to safe. Right? I think Daniel kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, like, regardless of the matchup, unless it's, you know, Chaos Demons, right? Like, we're taking minus one to safe. I just want to say, like, I take personally every contagion, right? Like, at every tournament I've been to over the past like four or five tournaments I've been to, right? Like, there's 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 almost always someone that wants minus one OC, minus one leadership, right? There's almost always someone that wants minus one weapon skill, plus skill, right? Um, it really depends on who you're you're playing. In some factions, you'll alternate between the two depending on the composition, right? So, for example, for sisters, right? If if it is a Dominion spam close range melt list. Um, I don't always bring minus one to save. I might bring minus one weapon skill, blessed skill, because Sister's biggest weakness is their hit roll, right? Yeah. They don't have a lot of sources for rerolls to hit with their melts, right? So saying, okay, if you want to get a melter range turn three, you're going to be hitting on fours, potentially fives, right? With your with your melts, that's huge. Um, that same that same army, Sisters, right? If they're spamming tanks. Well, I'm just never going to be able to use minus one weapon skill plus skill, right? Because they'll never be in range. So that's when I start looking at taking minus one save, right? To make sure that when I do activate, when I do get that shot, I will kill the thing I'm, I'm connecting with. And that logic really extends to everything. For example, elves, right? Like I, I uh, almost always take minus one OC, right? If it's like a like Cabalite spam Yanari list that's trying to like steal objectives from me. Um, but if I'm looking at two avatars, right? Like Minus one weapon skill, ballistic skill is looking pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it really depends on the list. And I, I encourage Death Guard players to like really think about what your opponent's game plan is and how they are going to to win. Right when you're picking your contagion, I, I will often take like in a minute or two as we're going over list and just think like, where do I see this game going? You know, if I'm getting if I'm getting activated on and, and my units are getting removed, how far away are they getting removed from? You know, so yeah. And sometimes at tournaments, like before the pairings, like I'll I'll go talk to Grant and I'll be like, hey, let's look at this list. Like sometimes, like I'm I'm kind of waffling between these two contagions, and you know we'll kind of talk about the list archetype. Like um, this was back when court was a really big thing. You know, normally you would take um, minus one OC, and you would really try to like 
just completely mitigate their ability to hold objectives, right? Because you know, with minus one OC, now raids are OC one. The entire unit is seven OC. I could put five plague marines on an objective, and it's mine, right? And that that is a huge deal, right? Or oh yeah, exactly. And then or let's, but it, it could be completely different if you're playing, say, uh, I think it was what uh, priority targets back in Leviathan. You need to kill those rates. Like they need to die, and that that's that's more important than minus one OC. And you need to ensure that they don't kill you back. So there, there's a lot of exactly what Grant is describing where you need to, and I think this comes with a lot of matchup experience with Death Guard or a lot of tournament play experience. You need to see exactly what he said, where the game is going. Because if you're taking Monster Weapon Skill, Monster Ballistic Skill, and they're not getting anywhere within nine inches of you, you know, that's a problem. Like Votan is the number one example for this because we've gone back and forth on this. And he's like, they're never going to be within nine inches of you to shoot you. That's just not happening. And they have Armor of Contempt. And they have Pulse on the Hit. So it's really counteracting it. Like, that's why you take against Space Marines. They have oaths. Yeah. You know, and and, and on a lot of them, uh, lists now, you know, not as much as before, have things like Redeemers. Redeemers don't care about, you know, Milestone Weapon Skill and Blessed Skill. They auto hit, right? You need to make sure that your Meltas are AP6. You need to make sure that your Death Shrouds are AP3 in melee, so on and so forth, so that when you do fight them, they're dead. Yeah. There is no like, oh man, you got cover, or like you AOC, now my AP two sides are AP one. It's like no, they're AP three, you know, or AP three, right? Yeah. So it, you need them to be able to crush whatever they're in combat with or whatever they're about to shoot. You cannot risk having anything survive. You know, and having one battle sister or one Dominion survive so that they can auto pass and then go into the middle and get area denial, that's a big deal. Because now you have to dedicate resources to kill that thing, and sisters are going to kill it back. So you traded a drone for one Dominion. Not a great trade. Yeah, not not, not ideal at that point. Um, so one of the few last questions on the list, and then I kind of want to talk about sort of like Death Guard in general slash the better, like how it is at the moment. Um, you've obviously gone for more melee weapons than I would personally take on my Plague Marines. Um, I just want to know your reasoning for that because I don't think it's a bad choice. I just I just want to know, was it just the fact that you said before you feel like when you want to hit melee, that's where Death Guard's best. You just want to hit as hard as possible whilst maintaining like an Overwatch threat. Um, so yeah, yeah. What, what made you take some B-Bikes in there as well as the heavies? So um, it really is about volume and AP, right? right. Um, I want to make sure that if I connect into like five Terminators, I'm going to kill them. Right, you you will often just whiff with uh, yeah. fifteen attacks. Tell me about it on a, on a four as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and then those AP one knives you're not going to cut it after the AOC, or well, it wouldn't work. But yeah, they're they're not going to cut it. Um, so that extra twelve attacks that I get from three body plague weapons means that um, if, with sustained fives potentially, that unit. Uh, sustained, yes, double sustained fives sometimes, that unit's going to die in melee. You, Death Guard just has way more buffs for melee, right, uh, than they do for shooting. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I see a lot of people run the two Melta guns, right, uh, which have lethal fives, which is really good. And, and I, I think there's play there, right? I, I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, I just already have that with my three brigands. Yeah. You yep. know? And ultimately, what I want that play brain unit to do is go dig something out of a wall. Um, and uh, yeah, just there's just there's just so many ways that like uh, I will get I think I will get more value out of the extra like twelve melee weapon attacks at AP two strength five than I will out of like two melta shots. Yeah, whether it be like fair. multiple activations, right, or just honestly like you know twelve attacks. That's like at least three wounds. Uh, yeah, four wounds actually on on a on a on a vehicle that's potentially at AP three and extra like four damage. You that's know? a fair point. That's a very fair point. Yeah. Um, one thing I would ask because I've been debating it myself, and a lot of people question it. Uh, ten man plague marines with the two characters. Obviously, the points rises. Uh, I don't think we're justified to be honest on those guys. Um, now the whole unit sits at three hundred points plus your seventy five for your rhino. Um, I've had the discussion, is that too much of a commitment to a unit? Um, obviously, some people say yes, some people say no. Where do you lie sort of in that um, discussion? Because it is an incredible unit, it's incredible, like a fight first, an incredible tool to have. But at the same time, we can't ignore the fact that it is a very expensive unit on a very, very yeah, fairly yeah. undurable um, squad. Yeah, it's, uh, I think I think Grant would probably agree with this too. I think a single 10-man is uh, almost critical because... 
it is battle line. Um, and again, what we were talking about earlier with brigands and like nurglings, your opponent will often ask you, how many battle line units do you have? Because they only see a plague marine squad. And you're like, oh, I have uh, five plague marines, nurglings, uh, brigand, 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 right? And they go, oh, wow, that's uh, okay. That secret's no longer uh, something that I can do. Um, a second 10 man is very pricey. And yes. I think what happens is you have to ask yourself, am I taking Death Shroud with Typhus? Or, you know, and like, and then something else because you're kind of losing, you know, about 50 points in addition. Or am I dropping something like Rodigus? So it's, it's really a judgment call. And it really depends on, like, I think it's a meta choice as well. Um, if you do have a lot of melee or you anticipate fighting a lot of melee in your army, yeah, try out the second 10 man. I mean, it's still really good. I mean, it's another 10 man that they have to deal with. And that's, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to take a third Rhino because if you're doing the, you know, the budget redeemer, you know, it, you can just have them disembark and advance into the middle, and then the, the playcasters get inside, and then you basically have what you wanted. So th there's a lot of play around there as well. It's just, it, it's a little bit of a stylistic choice, um, and also, like, what you're fighting. And I think, again, that's that judgment call you have to make before and after. Like, obviously, if they're playing, if your meta is mostly Guard and Votan, why not? You know, maybe take... Uh, a third brigand or so whatever yeah, yeah. Rodigus is also great there too right you know ap4 four, four damage in a land forts kind of hilarious <laughs> that's true yeah um so i think <laughs> the only only questions i've really got remaining about the list is uh one's the inclusion of nerglings and how you guys get the most out of them the other one is the only the one squad of cultists how do you use them how do you play them do you ever find yourself wishing you had more cheap like expendable units or do you feel like the i imagine you kind of see the drones kind of as that um but again i'll let you guys explain so we'll start with the nerglings um how, how come you know nerglings obviously are, they're the cheap and obviously you need well that i've answered my own question i already forgot you need them for Rodigus. <laughs> yeah you need them for Rodigus. Um, the big thing, too, is uh, in-depth matchups, they have, like, plus one to hit in melee. Um, Orcs is, for lack of a better term, a little bit of a slam dunk win-wise. Because, you know, if they're running knobs and they're running boys, like, you're just going to kind of sit there and, you know, have this smug look on your face as they charge into your Plague Marines because they have to. And then you just pick them up. But, you know, minus one weapon skill. And then, let's say you have Typhus, minus one to hit in melee. And if they have plus one to hit, you have an additional minus one to hit. Um, it's just a, it's, it's a force multiplier. We used to run, like, 18 before they had you know all these changes and yeah. it was you know six three mans and you just put them everywhere because they could all do actions now you know obviously you can't do that so you don't really need to invest a lot of points there um one of the things that you know, grant and i were talking about too is uh Jakari is a little bit of a scary matchup sometimes with a lot of the shooting especially if they're running i can see him <laughs> nodding his head uh you know if they have like something like a tantalus right that can be kind of terrifying a little bit um, but, you know, you can put those Nurglings out there for in cases like Drakari, and you can deny Scouts or Sisters. Yeah. You can have your Cultists, have your Nurglings, and they move out, and they deny the Dominions any ability of going in and killing your things. And that is worth 40 points. That's worth 90 points, you know, with, with the Cultists. You're trying to force them to not just rush you down, because, you know, Beastmasters are still kind of annoying to chew through. Especially if they make the six of Envolves, which happens more often than I would like, <laughs> and now you're boxed into your objective, uh, to your deployment zone, which is a problem. It, it, it's one to two nerglings minimum, right? Like, and and for me, yeah, the minus one to hit, as as Daniel said, is like really important. Uh, but a hundred percent, the most important part to me is having infiltrate, right, and the ability to prevent scout armies from just running over you. Yeah, right. Like Death Guard is the biggest weakness. Honestly, is getting outmoved and then outshot. Yeah. Right? I do not want you scouting across the entire map and then drawing lines to things that you should not be able to draw lines to. Right? And the Nurglings are there to make sure that we're all playing the same game. Right? Like you aren't going to like teleport essentially across the map and just absolutely destroy my day. You know? Yeah. For um, sure. Yeah. Um, that's, so, something that's something. Go. Go, go ahead. Yeah, you had you had to go ahead. Uh, yeah, and that's something that you know, like again, that that's very important. It's a critical gameplay style. I mean. I got a game into Bringers of Flame from one of our teammates the other day as like one of our first games because I, I played someone at uh, multiple people in the past. And I was like, this isn't really that scary, but then I find out afterwards that they kind of played a lot of their rules wrong. Okay, well, Vol doesn't have full rerolls and then Pulse One to hit and Pulse One to wound like you should. I'm a lot more scared of Vol than I normally would be. So, you know, that's kind of a big deal. But when you play a, a very seasoned Sisters player, if they can get 
line of sight onto a brigand because they're going to scout move, get out, advance, or you know, ad scout move, advance, disembark, and then shoot your brigand, and you lose a brigand turn one, which did happen to me the other day. It's like, okay, well, the game's over. You know, you've already lost a very critical part of your army because sisters do not like 12 shots at strength six, effectively AP three, depending on what you're doing. That yeah. That is Dominion Killer, and then it's going to shoot its Meltos at a, at a Castigator. And denying that is so critical to your gameplay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I think um, all the quick question is: Do you reckon there's anything you would change the list? I'm not. Li I'm not going to lie. Um, I'm sorry. I'm going to be a bit of a, a stealer here, but I actually think I'm actually thinking about picking up this list myself because it still seems to got a quite a bit of toolbox elements. Um, obviously, I've not used War Dogs, but this is probably the one I've liked the most. I have looked at the French WTC one, um, but it's just to me, I'm. A, I obviously did well, and it's obviously a good list. But we were saying just before here, I'm a little worried about like running like the sort of list because there's a lot of like flamers in it. Obviously, in teams you get to pick your matchup a bit more, so they can avoid like the vehicle more vehicle heavy ones. Um, and even though they they just went with the two brigands, and a lot of people say that two can be quite unreliable sometimes. Like the third one adds that redundancy you just need sometimes to get the job done. Um, and they obviously don't have any Terminators. They have gone for the double 10-man fight first brick. It feels a little bit more like a blunt hammer, sort of like just run at someone, keep, you know, all at once. Uh, and it's not really my sort of play style. Like, this looks a little bit more toolboxy. You've got the Plague Bus in there, which I, I actually just have fun, a lot of fun playing with that unit. Um, Rotogris is really cool. It's techie as well. I like techie pieces like that. Um, the only thing I don't have is triple flesh mowers. I only own two flesh mowers. Um, do you reckon you can get away with two flesh mowers and one spitter? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I, so. I think um, I think ultimately, like that third flush mower is often playing like defend the deployment zone, right? <laughs> and doesn't get the access to it anyways, right? So what what matters is that the two flush mowers, at least when I play the game, that are pushing down the uh, towards the opponent have um have the uh, the, the flush mowers. So yeah, two's fine. It's worth testing. And again, you know, obviously the, the France one WTC. Um, this this player, uh, uh, I forget his name. Um, uh, Clem is it Clement uh, Le Clem Le Bull. They call him the Bull. <laughs> so we'll say the Bull. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. His Elo name is different. So I was like, I'm pretty sure this is who this guy is because there's no one else with that name on stat check. But um, he actually he went four two and one, and um, his only loss was to Sisters, which you know they were probably running triple emulator, triple uh, Castigator. Like that, that's already kind of difficult to deal with in general. Yeah. Um, without three brigands, um, but his other matchups, he did he did pretty well, and I think he does fill that role as like a blunt um, player. Like he's trying to stop people from running running you, uh, him over, and I, like if you have a push army, he's going to roll up with all of these tanks and go, okay, here you go, deal with this, right? And that's that that role is filled in WTC and teams format as well because you can. What's really nice for Death Guard is you can actually dodge your bad matchups, more or less. And Death Guard are actually a pretty good scrum army as well, depending on the the, the, the archetype of your list, like the one that we have here. You know, then that that's it's one of those things where you identify your green matchups, you completely avoid your red matchups. Ideally, you have somebody else take those in the pairing process, and then Death Guard just doesn't get picked at all, and they're in the scrum. Yeah. And then you go, oh, I, I actually somehow ended up with orcs. <laughs> on, on a table like okay that that's a 20 right or um world eaters maybe not necessarily a 20 but more of a 15 or a 17 depending on you know how skilled the player is like if it's anthony vanilla you're, you're probably going to be more of a 13 7 just because the guy's a madman but you know if it's joe down the street or you know some other team that's not very large you can probably do it very well and that that's a big big aspect of the army Nice, nice. So what we'll do now is, uh, so just sort of like, well, we've got like about 15 or so minutes uh, left on it. Um, we we'll, one thing we'll ask is sort of like your guys' opinion on, because I mean, this list, I like it. I think this list uh, probably does better in singles than, I think that WTC is still hot, can really risk a coin flip on some of them. Um, I feel like Death Guard in general is a bit more coin flippy at the moment. Um, some of the top dog armies are quite nasty into us, but this seems to have the tools to deal with quite a little bit of it. Um, so I kind of just wanted to ask you guys' opinion on the overall meta at the moment, how you feel Death Guard sort of fits into it, anything you guys are super scared of or super like, ah, oh, this might need a bit toned down by GWA because it's a bit ridiculous. Um, but, but yeah, so Grant, do you want to go first, mate? Sure. Um, this is going to be kind of controversial. Um, oh, so I go for it, mate. Go for it. I don't think Death Guard have a bad matchup. Ooh, okay. I, I, think, 
I think the only bad matchup is bad terrain, right? So if you show up to a tournament and there's no terrain, right, and you're playing on Planet Bowling Ball and you can't execute your game plan, um, you're you're gonna lose, right? Um, I, I I genuinely think that like um, any any you have the tools, right? Um, in in this list or variants of this list, right? Uh, to take on any any army, any faction, right? Going first or second, you can figure out a win. Um, now you don't, you know, 40k is inherently like uh, a dice game, right? yeah. So you're not going to win every game, right? Um, but I feel like you can win the majority of them into into about any faction. Um, yeah, that's that's the exception might have been Thousand Suns before the torrent nerfs, but now that now that they have to play the game, <laughs> yeah, they can't just do that uh, nonsense. Yeah, with the rest of us, right? <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I'm, I'm less worried about it. Yeah, because I think I mean. I obviously had uh, experience in leads against like double monolith, um, hyper crypt, silent king, doomsday, and like that. It to me is hyper crypt a bad matchup. It's probably on the on the worst side. Is it a bad matchup? I think it was more my list was just atrocious into that list. It was like the specific lists were also just like at opposite ends of each other. And I, I also don't like my leads list. I'll be honest, um, it was a mistake. Um, I wanted to take Morty because I was worried about death like dark angels because obviously they're quite strong at the moment. And I wanted to ignore all the modifiers. And then when you actually play with Morty, you realize, like, man, that dude's a liability. And as soon as he dies, it's like, cool, the one thing I brought him for, I've now lost, and I got no value out of it at all. Um, so, yeah, okay, okay. That's an interesting opinion. So there's no there's no bad matchups. But I kind of get where you're coming from. Um, Death Guard do hit like a truck, and we do have a lot of damage output. I do wish we had some of the uh, tricks that certain armies have. Um because obviously there's quite a lot of movement tricks coming out. Hey, Blood Angel's got up and down. Did you see that, guys? <laughs> yeah. You're great. I mean, if you want a deep strike within three inches of my flamers, like, oh, I'm yeah, totally yeah. fine with that. Yeah, yeah. You go for that. That's fine. No problem. Uh, so go ahead, Dan. What's your yeah. opinion on the meta overall? Uh, I think the meta is actually pretty good. Um, it, it would arguably be the best it's ever been um, since, I think, forever. I think we're finally reaching a position where... Most armies can win. I mean, one of one of our teammates, Jason, he does well with Admech. I mean, he's, he's playing tower right now, so that kind of is a testament to that. But, like, Admech have, you know, some juice. They can win games. Oh, um, yeah. GSC, I mean, you, you, Grant, you know, he would definitely agree with that, too. Like, GSC, they have play. I mean, they're not unplayable. Um, Thousand Suns are a little overjuiced, I think, in some aspects. But, you know, it just takes a couple of changes here. And there. I, I think what it is for T-Suns is the archetype is a little too monodimensional. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Things like Doombolt could be changed to, like, you can't Doombolt the same target, you know, if you're going to double Doombolt. Yeah, you know, things like, like that. Um, make Scarab Occults cheaper. Make them actually have a good rule um, yeah. to where they do something. I think that would be really, really nice. I mean, same thing for Blight Lords, right? Like, reroll ones is just terrible. No, like, yeah. why, why would I ever <laughs> take that? Um, yeah, I think Death Guard, they definitely do have, like Grant said, the tools to be very, very effective in the meta and to essentially beat everything. And if you really sit down and, um, you know, kind of like um, in the very beginning when Death Guard were bad and you were actually, you know, crushing it over there in the UK, like you have to sit down and you have to actually think through the matchup. You have to read the list, like not just look at it, you have to read it yeah. and understand what's in it, how it's going to play, and then ask yourself, how do I play around this? How do I stop this, right? Do I just stat check them and like do what Grant does and come out? all at the same time, then they fail to kill anything because they split fire, because that's what everyone does. And um, then you just run them over. It's a lot of those types of decisions that need to be made. Um, not trying to be like, man, I really hope I make this 9-inch charge. That That's a big step up skill-wise for players, is just really hoping that, you know, like, man, I gotta make this 9 or else I'm gonna lose. So obviously, if you're getting tabled, you, you kind of have to make those plays. Um, but really, there's a lot of that there. Otherwise, like, I think everything's pretty good. Um, personally, for me, Bard has my phone number. I have just I've failed to beat them so many times, and every single time, it, the, the guard players are like, "I'm sorry, like I'm just rolling really well, and I don't know what to do." You know, <laughs> demo cannons, max shots, all hit, all wound. Um, I had a single scout sentinel kill a brigand, like that was really cool. Oh. <laughs> <It> just <laughs> rolls up, hit on fours, hit wound with everything, fail both, dies. I'm like oh. That's unlucky. <laughs> but yeah, I get what yeah. you mean. We all have yeah. those matchups. I, yeah. I have opposite, weirdly. Like, I don't have... Yeah, it's not me not having an issue with guard. I have a guard opponent that I play regularly. And his whenever he plays against me, he'll go to shoot... He'll have three tank commanders. 
kill all three of them, roll one for the shoot on death and fail every single shoot on death. I, 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 I don't know how. I can, it's been like multiple games in a row he's done it. I'm just like, can you fire at least once? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it is mad how it works. Um, so one thing I do want to say though about this list and about the opinions you just had then, um, War Dogs in general, I have I have I have come around on the opinion. Would you say War Dogs are practically mandatory at this point for not just for like playing at your club? Like I don't want everyone to out there be like, oh, I've got to get War Dogs to play a more friendly club. But if you want to take Death Guard to an event and do the best you possibly can, do you think War Dogs are almost reaching mandatory inclusion? So I will say this: the event you need to bring War Dogs. Yeah. If you, if, you, if you want to go X1, then you can bring whatever you want, right? Like, I mean, honestly, that's true with most things in 40k, right? Like, you can build pretty much any list you want in, uh, in Death Guard, right? And do reasonably well, I think. I, I really believe that. But yep. uh, if you want to, like, uh, you know, uh, on average, like, hit X1 or, or, or win, right? Like, I think War Dogs are mandatory because the, the weaknesses in Death Guard are so pronounced compared to other factions that um, you're really, really weighing yourself down by not uh, allowing yourself to take to, to, to take these allies. Yeah, it, and, and this is not meant to be a negative thing, but it, when, I, when I see a Death Guard list, generally speaking, and I don't see Brigands, there is that part of me that's like, I don't really take this list super seriously in a competitive environment. And that, that's not disparaging the player, it's just that when I see that, I think to myself, okay, you have no way of actually dealing with anti-armor. Yeah. You know, there, there's nothing here that I'm seeing or if I put a, a Land Raider Redeemer in your face, uh, Entropy Cannons are not going to kill that. Like, they might. You know, you might get lucky and kill it. You know, that that, that you know, it's dice, right? But if I don't see Brigands, I, I can't realistically see the list performing as well as I would want to. You know, and there are other units of Death Guard that, you know, the, the, the presence of them kind of do the same thing. You know, Blight Lord Terminators. They, they just do not do what things like Death Shroud do. You know, and, and if I see them or if I don't see Brigands, I... I worry about your ability to perform on the tabletop against these higher level lists, these higher level players, um, to an effective manner to where you can win. Or, in a team's format, have meaningful differential. I mean, the Gatling Cannon with minus one toughness and minus one save, and the extra AP being the closest target, you are able to effectively kill or damage most things. Tau battle suits, guard tanks, any infantry in the game light vehicles it, it's just so much strength six that you're wounding me on fives but it's 12 shots it's sending with the uh, the budget redeemer it's all strength six but it's ap2 ap3 if it's minus one save d3 damage auto hitting there's just so many things and as we've established with grant and with yourself death guard have you know let's be honest their data sheets kind of suck like for the most part they're really bad and I hope personally that's something that gw changes in the codex i i'm not i don't want like busted data sheets but I want something like where, like, it was a ninth edition. You know, I'm back in, you know, a couple of PSOs ago, I ran, like, 50 Plague Marines. And it was, like, 10 mans. And you had the, the the stench vats. And, like, those guys actually did damage. They were minus one damage. Their melee, all the damage carried over, right? They need something like that. And if you remove brigands from their the list archetype, they're not going to perform as well. They're just going to get run over. And that is a huge problem that the army has. I think if they want pure Death Guard to work, they're going to have to look into giving um, the entire army, in my opinion, some form of like 18 or 24 inch line up. Yeah. Like, like you're just going to get outshot, right, into a lot of matchups playing pure Death Guard. Um, yeah. If that if that's what replaces the the like minus one to save minus one weapon skill plus skill rule, great. Um, but uh, yeah, like they have to. The only way to make Death Guard competitive right now is like from a balance perspective is to either reduce their points a ton or make them ridiculously killy at short range, right? Yeah. And that's where we landed, right? We're now a debuff army. Uh, we're not tanky anymore. We're a debuff army that's cheap. They can kill really, really well in melee. Yeah, that's true. I, cause, I mean, I've definitely like as my my rule was to try and stay pure as much as possible. Um, since the sort of indirect nerf, um, not being able to do Boil Blight plays, because Boil Blight and the PBC mortars were the one thing that sort of like made up for the lack of anti-tank, because I made people come to me, because I could just yeah. pressure so hard with indirect constantly. Um, now that's just not as effective, because Fours is just super unreliable, um, and mm -hmm. basically I've noticed that in the games I've been playing while trying to be pure Death Guard and just use PBCs to do that, 
Um, my opponent just doesn't give a shit anymore. They're just like, cool, um, fire away. I'm just going to now push into the mid board. And you don't have too much that can like threaten my long range angles. Because um, like, even a PBC, if a PBC has to move around a building, you now want an 8 inch move because um, of pivot. And now you've only got 24 inch range um, like entropy cannons. It's not great. Uh, brigands don't pay pivot, correct? No, I just work here. I don't. I don't know these rules. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, because they're they're a vehicle on a round base, aren't they? So like, you don't have to pay that. Yeah. They move twelve. Like carnivores can move fourteen, uh, and they also just bring a shit ton of OC as well, which is like becoming more and more important uh, in the game. So like, OC is super important. Having eight on the when you think about it, like when I actually like think about why I'm not taking the 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 brigand over like the PBC, like in my head, I know the answer is pure stubbornness. Um, because there's no actual, like, factual point why I'm doing it. <laughs> okay, it's a bit tougher to kill, you know, two-up saves, nice. But at the same time, even then, like, the French list was three PVCs and brigands. Like, it's an and, it's not an instead of. Um, so I, I do think we are coming to the point where that even I'm having to let let go now and be like, okay, em embrace the war dog. I, I would prefer to run uh, PVCs, by the way, right? Like, I'm, I am, a like, a pure Death Guard player, or, or, you know, historically. I used to love just running three plague burst crawlers, right? Uh, Daniel, I used to fight, fight about it at the start of the, after the, the dark times, the first month of the, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the true well, we demons. We entered 40k. During, yeah. yeah. We didn't play death guard. We played demons during the, like the, 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 I, the I Eldar couldn't even blame you. I genuinely couldn't even yeah. blame you. It, yeah. It, it was the worst rule in the, in the, in the game, like minus one toughness and that's it. And sticky, like it just, your, your army was unplayable. And especially cause like, Eldar was very good. Space Marines back when they rerolled hits and wounds because of oaths, like you had nothing, and it was just it wasn't fun. So we hey, played demons. Were you the guy that won at GT though? Uh, During I went I went five and zero oh at GT. I was at the to yeah. the toilet dice incident. Um, but like literally, even like RTTs, I'd be coming home and my girl my girlfriend be like, "How you doing?" I'm like I'm like a husk, like ah, because <laughs> like, I'm I just to, I was frustrated. I was frustrated when I saw that you won. I was like, ah, oh, no. No, he won. Dang it. it was... GW's not going to give us any buffs. <laughs> it, it wasn't funny. It was like, it was playing on like Dark Souls difficulty of like just getting my head caved in, basically just sort of scraping out a win by five points. And the other guy's like, wow, that was, that was a close and fun game. And I'm just there like, uh. <laughs> I'm dying. Yeah. And I think, you know, your interview when you were talking about that with, was with Art of War, yeah. where you kind of gave the same analysis, right? Where you, you need to put a lot of effort into that, into uh, the the pregame analysis, because if for you, if, if with old Death Guard, if you made a mistake, you lose. Yeah, you know? and that that's not necessarily a dice thing; that's more of a tactical error. Um, Death Guard still has a decent amount of that. You yeah. you can't just walk into the middle and hope that your minus two to hit works because at the end of the day, if you're minus two to hit and they're hitting on fives, well, if they roll fives, <laughs> it yeah. doesn't help, you know, you still put your dudes there and that, that's a big problem. Um, but yeah, it's things have gotten a lot better for sure. I, I am a little concerned about the codex. I, th I think I saw, I think it was a real slash. I don't know if it was a real or fake roadmap, but there was a death guard yeah. was on there and I, I'm a little concerned because it, the, the Codex pathway has been decent so far. Some Codex have, has have been good. Some of them not very playable at all. Um, you know, Grant might disagree, but GSC is largely kind of in the dumpster. Um, but he takes like a thousand points of guard, so I don't know if that's really GSC. <laughs> but there's a, a joke in our team that you're just playing allies with Death Guard or allies with GSC. And it's, you know, <laughs> we need good data sheets. It's, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, wouldn't play, you know, if, if that's the way it's got to be, that you know, if that's what's going to get us the success, then you've got to embrace it at the end of the day. Like, if we're here to be competitive players, like, we've got to use the tools at our disposal and allies are tools, really. Um, yeah. At the end of the day. I mean, so, yeah. I mean, any, I've, I've not too much left to cover because I don't want to take too much of you guys' time today because uh, I do really appreciate you coming on. I know it's quite early in the morning for you guys there as well. Um, but, yeah, if there was anything sort of, like, we'll, we'll do one wish for the Death Guard Codex. Obviously, you said improved data sheets, but, like, maybe one, like, specific thing you'd like to see when the Codex coming up. Um, is there anything you could think of top of your head? Yeah, I, I think I mentioned it earlier. Uh, I want one of the detachment rules to be, like, 18 or 24 inch one-off. I, yeah. I think that... I that would think be that, super interesting. Yeah, I, I think yeah. if the offensive power is going to go down, we need to, like ratchet down the ability for ranged armies on light terrain to just roll over 
most Death Guard lists, right? Like, I've kind of had to build my list to compensate for the fact that, like, if I just build a stock Death Guard list, there's nothing I can do really about Guard. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. I would say favorite. for me, it would be, um, I would like all of these attachments to actually have play. Um, we have seen this this thing arise, especially in competitive play, where a lot of armies, like Space Marines, for example, you really only see Gladius Task Force. Like, you see a little bit of Suns, but, like, that's non-Codex compliant chapters, right? But a lot of armies, they have one one detachment that is, like, viable. Yeah. And I would like to see all of the Death Guard detachments actually be playable. It's not just, okay, this is the Terminator detachment or the Typhus detachment where Poxwalkers are good. Well, Poxwalkers are shit, so... You know, my cool strats, like like Terminus S from 9th edition, right? It was such a cool, like, detachment that had I a lot of cool it. rules. Yeah, but, you know, you could deep strike, but then, like, certain things couldn't deep strike, and, like, certain rule, like, stratagems were only once per game, and it, it just didn't really mesh well, and it, it didn't feel good at all. And I, I would like to see that with Death Guard, and I think that's something that they're trying to work on at GW, because... You know, just having, you know, the, the Terminator detachment have a cool rule that, like, doesn't really do anything doesn't actually make that detachment playable at all, unfortunately. I, I think we should get a, a rule. It's called Oaths of Slowman. And uh, you put it on an opponent's unit and it can only move four inches and can't advance. And, it, and it's just so they can feel how we feel sometimes. <laughs> so, we, give, we give them all of our abilities. <laughs> we get theirs. <laughs> so, funny story... Uh, I would like to say uh, you you can make an eight inch move unit move zero uh, <laughs> on their on their turn right if you half OC with Rodigus and shoot both play casters at it it gets halved and then minus two minus two and they stack actually oh so, <laughs> oh yeah I know they stack but I didn't yeah. think about doing that with it um, <laughs> that's quite funny but there yeah Osa Sloma <laughs> yeah Osa Sloma is what we're gonna call it right okay so um, is there anything you want to shout out, guys, before we sort of wrap this up? Because apparently I've just been informed that the house at the end of the road is on fire. So that's good fun. <laughs> so I'm probably going to have to nip off very soon, <laughs> just in case. The bringers of flame are here. <laughs> um, no, I think uh, just um, thank you again for having us on your podcast. Like we said, we saw your video. Um, I, I hit you up on Reddit and like, I try to hit you up everywhere. I was like... Let's you know, let's let's have a little talk just because you know, like this is kind of the archetype that we want to see more Death Guard players try and like experiment with. Yeah. Because I think it really will maybe not necessarily bring up the win rate, but it'll make Death Guard players a little more dynamic in their gameplay. Um Yeah. Otherwise, thank you for having us on, man. This has been great and we're gonna continue doing our thing. I'm gonna continue telling Grant that um that I write all of his lists and he uh <laughs> And Grant will continue pointing at his six and zero. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, it's, he has higher elo than me, and um, he consistently performs better. But I always tell everyone those are my lists, not Grant's. Well, they, all, they always say behind a great, great artist is an even greater roadie. So you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm the guy behind the curtain, <laughs> all the leakers. <laughs> Anything for you to shout, Grant? Uh. Yeah, I, I think for me, um, as we're getting into uh, the like pre-Codex territory for Death Guard, um, I, I know I've kind of like evangelized my version of Death Guard for the past hour, um, but I think the, the most important part of 40K and what truly really makes it fun is experimenting, right? Yeah. So I would encourage players to take what I said, um, not, necessarily, not necessarily the list, right? Um, but the concepts behind it. Right, so the reasoning behind why I've picked these units and apply that to their own list, right? So maybe you don't need to run three brigands, right? Maybe you find something with three blight haulers, right? Like there, there are, uh, what's more important than the list itself is how the list is played. Yeah, it is true, it is true. Like uh, and a, a good player with an average list will be an average player with a good list. Like that, that much is true. And if it doesn't, then the army's considered launch elder um, <laughs> um but, but i don't yeah. think we're there anymore no i'm thankful we're not there anymore. but yeah I, i'm actually i'm actually my order erogus because i actually really want to try out this list and i don't own erogus either so it would be cool to get some allies in to sort of try this out and also makes it fresh for me because i've been stuck to pure for so long it's nice to be able to try new things and this looks like a kind of list i would enjoy playing so um it, i might even take it to london this list so let, i've got an rt coming up Take it to that, see how it goes, and you might have even inspired me to, uh, should we say, borrow your list idea, not steal. We borrow over <laughs> here. Have fun. 
<laughs> it, it's all a gift for the plate god and that's all that, <laughs> that is true that is true but yeah thank you so much for coming on guys so uh once again um these are now the rank, rank one one two three isn't it in, of a death guard in, in the world which is actually quite cool as well so um hopefully have you guys back on at some point it'd be cool to do something like a again like maybe in the next balance today we could do like a tier list together because you guys have good opinions on like the units and like stuff like that so that could be cool to get you back on for that uh, if you'd be interested in it but thank you so much for coming on for now um, for the listeners, if you did enjoy the content, leave a like and a subscribe and consider becoming a member if you would like to support the podcast. That would be excellent. Um, do you guys have anything that people can follow you on, get into contact with you, or maybe just a team uh, to be what shout out? Um, yeah, so we, we, I really just social media on our end, but um, we do have our team server that we're a part of. Um, otherwise, you know, just uh, keep an eye out for us at events. Uh, we're going to Champions Cup in Dallas. Um, if you're if you're on the West Coast, we're going. Um, our team actually hosts uh, the California Cup. Uh, we are trying to get a lot of guys to eventually go out to London. It's just you know on the West Coast, it's really far. But otherwise, yeah. just a lot of West Coast GTS and the like. Um, I in the next year or so, I may find myself on the East Coast for a bit. Um, so I'll definitely try and be out there. And, you know, trying to trying out. Ideally, the Codex will be out by then and uh, trying out new stuff. But. Um, if you, if, you want to, if you want to come on at some point and chat about the codex when that comes out, more than happy of that as well. Um, that would be amazing. Yeah, we'd love to do that. Um, we got you on Discord now too, yeah, so yeah. I mean, we can definitely. You got me on touch. Facebook as well, so you can always just shoot us a message whenever. Um, so yeah, absolutely, that would be awesome. Um, but yeah, anything else, Grant? Anything? Any team? Oh, you're the same team, aren't you? <laughs> no, I'm saying that. Yeah. <laughs> it's the exact same team. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no socials really to shout out. I'm not a big uh, content guy, but I love talking about 40k um yeah. so yeah i mean i don't know you can you can contact me over facebook <laughs> no worries <laughs> well thank you so much for coming, guys uh so yeah if you enjoyed it leave a like and subscribe and we'll catch you all on the next episode stay right everyone and we'll catch you all on the next one take care bye-bye thanks everyone